Welcome to Braden of Vats. We are delighted to be joined by one of our favorite guests, Roger Hawani. Roger and I and Jason always talk about the philosophy of sex and love. And today we're going to be doing something a bit different. We're going to be talking about the Israeli-Palestine conflict. And our intention is to try and have a philosophical discussion. So often we won't go into as much detail um, as you would like about a particular conflict. But we'll try and think what the big questions are on this topic, which has vexed people for decades. Roger, would you like to start with a thought experiment? Yes, thank you guys for having me on the show again. I think this is, what, the fifth time? <laughs> it's like a Catholic marriage. Okay, so I'm going to start with a thought experiment that is a thinly disguised attempt at what actually happened in history, but let's take it for it. Is. So imagine you have two groups of people, let's call them Group A and Group B. I'm going to start by saying something about Group A, then something about Group B, and then their interaction with each other, and then I'm going to throw out the question about this thought experiment. So imagine that Group A has been inhabiting a certain chunk of land, let's call it Territory T, since basically around the 7th century AD, basically, if not even since ancient times. And then just around the turn of the 20th century or so, they started witnessing a number of immigrants coming from outside, of, outside the land, and some whispers that land is going to be turned into a new homeland for those new immigrants. Now, those immigrants happen to be from the other group, which is, let's call them Group B, who maintain also a lot of in ancient ties to the same land in question, but who have been since ancient time dispersed from the land in question, although they have managed to maintain a presence, mostly thin throughout history, but a presence nonetheless, until about the turn of the 20th century, actually earlier when they started the, when they started the immigration. Now, one thing important to keep in mind about Group B is that their presence in the diaspora since ancient times has also been characterized by more or less constant persecution by the, by, among the people that they, lived up, that they lived with, especially Christians. This was especially the case in Europe, in West Europe and in East Europe. So in, in earlier history of West Europe, you had a couple of countries that expelled members of Group B from their countries and only a couple of centuries later allowed them back in. In Eastern Europe, they were forced to live in, in certain areas that was designated to them. They were persecuted, killed, treated terribly. And all of this culminated later in the 20th century by, with a huge genocide that has come to be called the Holocaust, right? Now, to go back to Group A, since the turn of the 20th century, they have been witnessing more and more immigration from members of Group B. And then <clears throat> until um, around the early 1940s, there was even more immigration coming in because, as we, as, because certain fascist regimes were on, started to gain power in Europe and members of Group B wanted to leave the European continent, specifically certain countries, basically. At, at that point, the International Umbrella Organization, let's call it the United Nations, decided in 1947 to partition the land between members of Group A and Group, a and group B so that each group has its own state, right? Members of Group A outrightly rejected the partition plan, basically, at which point <clears throat> a war ensued <clears throat> and members of Group B were able to acquire by force the territory that was actually allotted to them by the partition plan, but they were also able to acquire a little bit more territory, right? And then, so we had de facto borders between the two groups until 20 years or so later, where another major war erupted at which the members of Group B, which now have their own state, were able to even acquire even more land. The territory T that was under dispute the whole time now has come to be completely under the control of Group B, under state B, which we can call them now state B. Since then, there has been a stalemate. Members of Group A have come to accept what has come to be called the two-state solution, that there should be two states. But the political and historical record seems to indicate that <clears throat> State B is not actually interested in a two-state solution. They have been trying to acquire as much territory as possible, and they have been moving, since that second war happened, they have been moving members of their own people to settle the lands that they have acquired. And so we have now currently a political stalemate. One of the interesting philosophical questions that comes out of this is, what is the morally correct solution to this conflict between the two? A number of solutions have been proposed. My favorite solution is a one-state solution that members of both groups are actually able to share the land together. Thank you, Raja. I like the way you phrased that. I think it, it takes a lot of the emotionality out of the debate. So a question, why do historical claims matter or historical events matter in today's times. So why does it matter whether group A or group B was around X number of hundred years ago? Should we find that claims made about what happened 
further back in history matter more than claims that happened subsequently? Or is it the other way around? Is it that events that happened more recently take precedence? So for example, you mentioned that Group A was around before, Group B dispersed, there were fewer of them, but Group B was around in some diluted amount after. Historical precedent, does it matter? So that's my first question. And the second question is, in virtue of what should we think that these are the same groups as historically present? So in virtue of what do we think that Group A, let's call them the Palestinians or the Arabs, were around a few hundred years ago are still the same group of Arabs or Palestinians around today versus the Israelis or Mm. the Jews? Why think that's the same set, the same group? It's certainly not the same set. It's not the same individuals. So why think it's the same group? The first question, I think, goes to the heart of a set of philosophical questions that philosophers in political philosophy have been paying more and more attention to them. I'm going to address the second question first, because I think it's a little bit easier to address than the first one. So in virtue of what do we maintain that a certain group is still the same group through historical lineage? I don't think we have any clear criteria about this other than sheer biological descendancy, basically. So it's a sheer continuity, right? Now, of course, biological continuity is not going to be enough, right? If we talk about the Palestinians, someone can easily make the case that contemporary Palestinians today can trace their biological descendancy through all the way down to the Canaanites who were living in ancient Israel at the time, right? But of course, it's we're hard pressed to say that the Palestinians of today are the Canaanites of ancient times because for all sorts of reasons, yeah, the most important one being the language and the customs and religious practices, right? Um, the best way to delineate whether a certain group is still the same from historical times is to try to find as many criteria as possible that they fulfill that we tend to think, <clears throat> even though not a single criterion is itself sufficient, a certain number of them might be enough to give us some degree of confidence that this is the same group, at least in terms of historical continuity. So language is one of them. And so the reason why I mentioned the 7th century AD is because this is when the Arab conquests basically took place shortly after the rise of the Prophet Muhammad. And the the Arabs went into Persia and they went into Africa. But what concerns us now is, of course, the, the, the part of the Middle East that is now Lebanon, Syria, and Palestine, and Israel. So, of course, they went there, they maintained the presence, they intermingled with the people who were living there. We know that there have been Christian Arabs living there before the Islamic conquests, right? And the people who came in were speaking Arabic. The people who were there adopted the Arabic language, which is one of the big mysteries, actually, of Islamic conquest, which is why those people adopted, a lot of the people around the world adopted the Arabic alphabet, if not the language itself, right? And so you have the language, and then you have the religious customs that have, so with Christianity being there, it's it's soon intermingled with Islam, and of course, with certain Judaism, and we still find that present until the present day, basically. And so the religious customs and so on and so forth. Now, you can come up with different, with other additional criteria such as the food and, and the literature and dances. Of course, the more you come up with criteria like this, the harder it will be to maintain the group's identity because some of them are more recent. So, for example, there is a very famous debate among the Turks and the Greeks and the Arabs about who invented baklava, right? Who came up with baklava? If you talk to each person, they say it came from us. You can't say baklava is the criterion because it doesn't go that back enough. So, to answer the question, to answer your question, it's very hard to make a claim about the same group being the same, other than certain kind of lineage, basically, that can be traced back into the past. And the more criteria that we think are relevant that applies to this constant thing, thus the more secure we are in the case. But I don't think we are completely secure. However, that doesn't mean that you cannot make, that you cannot confidently assert group identities through shorter spans of time, right? So it's much easier, for example, for me to say that the Lebanese people right now are the same group, right, as they were, say, 200 years ago. Right? The further we go back in time, the more difficult. So that answers the second question. Your first question was, what is it about claims of history that has relevance that is related to questions like this? And one of the main issues of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is not just the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it's, it, it, we can find it around conflicts all around the world, but it certainly characterizes this one, is basically the question, who has territorial rights over the land that we can call historic Palestine. And for the rest of this discussion, I'm just going to use the term historic Palestine. It's going to refer to the area that is currently Israel today, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, basically, right? Not the Golan Heights, not East Jordan, none of those territories. So the question is, which group of people has the authority, has the rights to to inhabit and live in the territory that we can call historic Palestine? 
one of the main reasons we use to basically say this group, but not that group, has territorial rights is historical habitation of the land. The idea here is that when you have a group that has been inhabiting a certain territory for a long period of time, that gives rise to a number of things. It gives rise to their way of life, basically. So their way of life is enmeshed with the territory. It gives rise to a certain kind of interests that they have as a group to basically maintain their connections to the land. And it basically gives rise to these historical connections and the way they maintain their identity. In other words, we start thinking of the people and the land not so much as separate from each other, but our very conception of the people is interactive with how we think of the land. So we think of the French people. We don't think of the French people as floating in some space somewhere, although I'm sure some British people would like that. We think of the French people as actually inhabiting a specific territory in Europe. They are tied to that particular geographical location. So historical claims to the land are important because they give us at least one crucial answer as to why a certain group has the right to inhabit and have some sort of sovereignty over that specific piece of land. Now, this doesn't mean that just any historical claim can work. So one clear example, for instance, is our claims to first residency, right? So suppose, for instance, you have a group that has been inhabiting, and I'm not saying this with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in mind at all. I'm just giving this as a because I don't want people to think that I'm taking a jab at this. Uh, so suppose, for example, you have a group that's been inhabiting a certain piece of territory for, say, 600 years, right? But before that, there was another group that was living there, and for all sorts of reasons, say economic, climate conditions, what so on, they moved out of that territory 600 years. They can't come back now and say, we have territorial rights to that land because we were first inhabitants on the land. In other words, time and what happens through time makes a big difference also. Too. So it's not just historical connection. It has to be historical connection and also a certain, con certain kind of maintenance of this historical connection through time. That's why claims to be first residents of the land will have very little cachet among political philosophers unless those claims continue to the present time, basically. So I'm interested in the idea of how you resolve the conflict and you put forward the idea of a one-state solution. And you said a lot of discussion has been around a two-state solution. The other view that's almost never discussed but seems what actually is going on the ground is really three states. People tend to think about Palestine as, or Palestinians as inhabiting one territory that is contiguous with one government that agrees with it, and that's not the case. You have Hamas and Fatah in different parts of the country with very different norms. Fatah, I think, probably leans more secular. Hamas has more radical claims, is more religious. It's not clear that if those two regimes were part of one entity that there'd be agreement between them even. So I also think about other kinds of parallel cases. So South Africa is a nation filled with many nations. At one point in time, South Africa was had a series of Bantustans or microstates inside of it with the idea that some ethnic groups should be given territory and that they should have self-governance over that territory. It was rather disastrous, partly in the sense that those groups were puppet regimes, that they were controlled by the apartheid government, that they weren't really given fair access to resources and land. But you could imagine that happened differently, that instead of there being one united South Africa, at times before 1910, for example, South Africa was many different countries. And you can imagine that. That's happened in the rest of Africa. You had large contiguous states that have been split up. And sometimes splitting the state up leads to some kind of peace and coexistence and collaboration because people are able to self-govern. That strikes me as an interesting problem, is on what basis should you set up a state? Is it on the basis of, let's say, a language, a culture, an historical affiliation? Does it sometimes make sense to have separate states because things are more peaceful? And what, how would that play out in Israel at the moment if you had those different scenarios? I think in discussions like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we have to distinguish between descriptive facts on the ground and normatively what we would like to see happen. So even if somebody were to grant, for instance, that as far as the Palestinians are concerned, they really have some sort of two states because of the divergence in the political visions between, say, Hamas and Fatah, right, or the Palestinian Authority, that would be a descriptive case at most. So it wouldn't touch the normative issue as to whether what sort of ultimately what sort of a good solution there should be. But also very briefly about the descriptive thing, I don't think that the Hamas, say Fatah, although Fatah is not as much in the ascendancy as it used to be anymore, I don't think the political split among the Palestinians is any different in principle 
from certain political splits that we find in many states, even highly functional ones. For example, in the United States right now, you can, certain, you can find certain factions of Republicans who are highly conservative, highly religious in many ways, who are at the throats of certain ultra progressive lib lefty, lefties. And so you will always have, I think what complicates the Palestinian question is, is the fact that the state doesn't have an actual proper functioning mechanism precisely because of the Israeli control since the Oslo Accords of 1993, right? So it's hard to gauge basically. But I think descriptively speaking, in principle, it's not different from, from other kinds of states. Remind me, Mark, sorry, what was the second question? Yeah, so the question is, if how do we ground the idea of the state? Is it desirable to have lots of self-governing places. You could imagine a federal structure. You could imagine a one state <coughs> with different provinces. That might be one way of thinking about it. And the other right. one to say, no, there must be different countries. And I wonder what principle we should use to determine that. Right. So there are, in political philosophy, there are different principles that have been given as to why, as to how states can be justified. For example, one principle is the principle of self-determination. So you decide which groups of people have the right of self-determination over which territorial geographical area. They, by exercising the self-determination, they have they put a government in place and so then they have a state. And it's important in this conversation to distinguish between a people and a state, right? Depending on your philosophical view, a state is basically a machinery, a government that allows the people to govern themselves, basically. And as, especially if it's a legitimate state that would be done through a democratic process. If it's not legitimate, it would be more dictatorial and so on and so forth. But it's important to, to maintain this distinction between them, right? Other justifications for states could be, as you mentioned, is that you need a certain kind of state that is able to maintain the peace, basically, right? But what I wanted to, what I want to make clear is that <clears throat> we also have to make another distinction, which is between different forms of the one state solution, right? So you can have a form of a one state solution that is also able to maintain the peace, if you envision the single state along certain lines. So for example, you suggested a federation, right? So you can, if you look at the, if you look at, for example, at the current map of historic Palestine, right? You are likely to find certain areas, even within Israel itself, that have more Jewish concentrations than you have Palestinian concentrations, because I'm sure you know about 21% of the Israeli population citizens are Palestinian Israeli citizens, right? And then, so if you decide to have a single state, you can envision it along some sort of a federal state where at least for a certain time being, different portions of the state can have different types of population concentrations. So some areas will have a Jewish concentration, others will have a Palestinian concentration, still others will have a more mixed concentration and so on and so forth. And through that system, you are able to have some sort of stability where, say, Jews do not feel that the Palestinians are encroaching on their neighborhoods, and you'll have to you'll have to figure out a way. So, to say that you have a single state doesn't, in and of itself, basically say what form that state should take. As a matter of fact, historically speaking, some people have advocated for a form of binationalism, right? So it's not it could be a federation, but basically binationalism is the idea that the state would be for two people the Jews and the Palestinians, and then you have to figure out what you do with immigrants and with foreigners to the land. Another form is to have a democratic secular state. So it would be a state for all its citizens, although we all know that the majority of those citizens are going to be Jewish and Palestinians, right? So my point is that just saying a single state isn't necessarily going to basically say what form that state could take. And we could be sensitive to the historical realities on the ground so that in devising the state, we do it in such a way to minimize as much political and military friction as possible, right? So why a single state? I think the Palestinians as a group, as a nation, basically, as a people, haven't lost their territorial rights in the region. They still have territorial rights to the land, even though many of them live in exile as refugees since 1947, basically. But also, on the other hand, I think Israeli Jews since 1947 have come to acquire territorial rights in historic Palestine. So the solution cannot be to keep Palestinians out, right? And it cannot be to kick the Jews back out. Where are they going to go? Basically, to, to most Jews now in Israel, Israel is their land, is their home, basically. There. So to me, it goes without saying. So the most solution that the solution that is most just to both people is going to be some sort of solution that allows both groups to exercise sovereignty over this land and it seems to me that one state solution is the one that satisfies this criteria so i've got two questions the one is it seems weird to me for a group to have rights over a piece of land i can understand why i would have rights to a piece of land that my father had rights to but not because we're part of a common group, but because I inherit the land from my father, let's just say he puts it in his will. 
that I can get. I can understand how an individual can have rights over a piece of land. I can understand how the descendants can have rights over a piece of land, but purely because of the individual contracts involved, that if I own a piece of land, I have a contract with the state, and the state honors my will to pass that piece of land over to my son and over to his son or daughter or descendants. But that doesn't make sense. That relationship doesn't make sense in the case of groups. It's weird to think that the group has a contract with the state in a way that individuals do. It's not clear that we can find a piece of paper um, here. So that's strange to me. And then my second question to you is, it's related, is do you think that a religious group can have a right to a piece of land or a right to have a state built around that religion? One reason why people might think they do is because they might say that a religion is valuable just in and of itself for being a religious group. And so just in virtue of that, they deserve or have a right, or we have obligations to give them some piece of land. What are your thoughts? So there is, in political philosophy, there is something called the Lockean theory of the state, which of course goes back to John Locke. According to John Locke, the state is justified in two ways, right? So it is justified because it needs to coordinate all the properties of the individuals, basically. Otherwise, individuals are going to be in a state of nature and they're not. So people come to acquire property by mixing their labor with a property, right? So if I come to if I come to an uninhabited terrain and I and my family mix our labor with that terrain, then according to Locke, I somehow acquire property rights over that specific area. Now, of course, there are lots of problems with this theory, but we don't need to worry about the theory. So the main problem for Locke and states is, all right, if we have a number of, if it's not just Raja who's out in nature, but there's also Mark and Jason and Raja, and we all know that Jason happens to be particularly vicious about certain things, always grubbing and greedy and wanting to take other people's lands, then we need a way to coordinate the different properties that we have. Locke's justification of the state is that the state is needed to basically coordinate the properties of the individuals, right? The other justification of the state, according to Locke, is, of course, it has to be consensual. In other words, the three of us have to come together and form a pact and basically agree amongst ourselves that we will give up certain natural rights that we have so that we can have this extrajudicial authority that can oversee our lives and solve any coordination problems that we have and, and other sorts of problems, basically. So there is a sense, Jason, in which there is a Lockean answer to your question, which is that even though individuals might have specific pieces of property that says that they have, sorry, pieces of paper, as you said, that says that they have rights over the land, right? Like passports, for example, or I suppose a document that says that the state recognizes your ownership of this piece of land. There is also a sense in which when the three of us, at least according to Locke, come together and agree to pose this government to help us resolve any potential disputes, we have basically given the state certain rights over us. Now, whether that makes us a legitimate group on your view or not, is still a question to be settled. And that has to do with the ontology of groups, whether there is such a thing called a group that does not disaggregate into its individual members. Of course, we can disagree about that. I think, Jason, you're of the view that there are no groups, right? That groups just simply disaggregate into individuals. That might be true, right? But in this regard, I'm going to mention two things. One is there seems to be a difference between general territorial rights held by groups over a land versus individual rights held over a land. So, so for instance, I could own a piece of property in the United States of America, right? But the government can decide for some reason or other that it has sovereignty over my land. So even though I own that piece of property, there will be certain cases in which the government can do certain things to me to disenfranchise me from having that property, right? And if you think of the government as being the representative of the people, right? So what I'm trying to say, individual rights to property don't seem to be the same thing as group rights to that property, right? Now you can reject group rights to property altogether and that's fine, but you would be going against the grain of the discourse about this. We seem to agree that there are group rights regardless of whether we think of groups as their own entities or whether they're just a collective of individuals, basically. For the second question, there has been a lot in, in, in political philosophy. Another just, I mentioned in, earlier in, in answer to Mark's question about keeping justice or keeping the peace, this would be the Kantian solution to state. Maintenance of property, this would be the Lockean solution to the state. But there have also been political philosophers who basically said that states are justified to some extent because they preserve cultures. This is especially true in, if you think about it in terms of nationalist movements, where if we buy into the idea of a French people, the German people, 
people, the Lebanese people, right? Then you start thinking maybe states are needed in order to protect these nations, right? We see that to some extent in giving indigenous groups in Canada and the United States some amount of autonomy, basically. We see that to some extent, although they don't amount to states. But that you see the justification at work there. Basically, why do we give, why does Canada give certain indigenous groups a certain measure of autonomy? The idea is that it's important for the preservation of their culture. So someone can justify a state on the basis of cultural preservation. And that's just one step from saying that you can also justify a state on the basis of religious preservation. So somebody can say, look, as a group, as a religious group, we are persecuted. We need to basically be able to live our lives in peace, to practice our religion in peace. And so having a state is justifies that. Now, I'm not sure that having a state actually goes all the way to a justification. It might if we have certain conditions in place. What conditions are these if there is no other way of doing it, basically, right? And one thing you have to think about, you have to consider in this is that states are not necessarily the best thing to preserve groups if those groups are really being persecuted. In other words, if you have a small religious minority, right, let's call it group R, right, and it's been persecuted by its neighbors, the fact that R is able to form a state in order to preserve its religion might work. But if the groups that are really set upon R, <laughs> they might de facto override the fact that R now has a state, right? Now, there will be more obstacles because once you have a state in place, we the international community comes to recognize its independence, its autonomy, and so on and so forth. So aggressions against it will have to have a high threshold of justification. But I'm just saying that from a real point of view, if, the, if people really want to persecute that group, the fact that they have a state is not going to deter them. As a matter of fact, we see it over and over. Just to look at the Russia-Ukraine example right now, Russia has pretty much self-indulgently attacked Ukraine. We all accept Ukraine as an independent state and so on and so forth. This has not deterred Russia from doing what it wants to do. It just depends on how much chutzpah uh, the aggressing country basically has. So, yeah, <laughs> that was a long-winded way of answering a question, but I think it's answered it a little bit. Yeah. So I suppose what's interesting about thinking about a state that has a certain character to it, either a religious character or an ethnic character, and how some states really are that way in the sense that everybody who lives there speaks a certain language and follows the same faith uh, and aren't multicultural at all. And Israel, I suppose, is interesting in the sense that it has a Jewish character to it in ways that are interesting. I lived in Israel for a fair amount of time, and one of the things that's unusual is that nothing happens for New Year's. I found this strange. I assumed that I'm in a Western country, will they be doing something for the 31st of December? And they said, why? This is in our calendar. So you feel that. You see that in, in Tel Aviv, not much happens during Easter, whereas in South Africa, those Christian sort of things are very prevalent. There's Easter bunnies around everywhere. And certain Jewish holidays are a big deal. The wind's not a big deal there, but for Purim, people get dressed up. And so that's, it has that character. But it's also multi-ethnic and multi-religious, and that Judaism itself is far from one thing. So one of the big conflicts inside of Israel is between secular Israelis and ultra-Orthodox Israelis. They see themselves as having different obligations to the state. Ultra-Orthodox Israelis don't serve in the Israeli army, for example. Neither do Arab Israelis. The Druze, a separate ethnic group, do serve in the army. And so there's a sense in which you've got a variety of different beliefs and customs and trying to work out how you accommodate this. Israeli party politics, for example, you don't have single party dominance. It's not just two parties like you have in America. It's a wide variety who believe a whole bunch of different things and who have to come together to find some kind of deal and compromise. That's the nature of it. Israelis themselves come from all parts of the world. It's funny, it's a it's a bit of a rude question to ask someone in Israel, where are you from? And in South Africa, it's not a rude question. People will say, oh, my ancestors are from Germany or from France or from Holland or wherever. And there people say, I'm from Israel. So where are you really from? They'll say, from Israel. And they'll get angry with you. Their ancestors came from North Africa, from Spain, from Germany, from Eastern Europe, from Russia, from Ethiopia, from a huge range of places. And there's been a sense of saying we should have an Israeli national identity and a common resurrected language in the form of Hebrew. But even then, you still have all this sort of internal disagreement. And so what's interesting to me is thinking about this tension between how you deal with different kinds of groups. They might seem like they're the same group when really they aren't. The one view is you say you should have, you could have one, one country which has different federal structures um, or whether you think it's important to preserve a certain character. So let's say, for example, Morocco wants to make the claim in order to be a Moroccan citizen, you have to worship a particular God. 
can they make such a claim? Can they say, we think it's important that you have Muslim states? 300,000 Jews, for example, were kicked out of neighboring states in North Africa um, on the grounds that we want these states to have a certain character and you don't fit that character. And so those people were driven into exile. Could you say that if you have a separate state, let's say for Palestinians, could they say it's for Palestinians only? If you're Lebanese, you're not welcome. It's for Palestinians only. If you're, there are Palestinian Christians and Palestinian Muslims, but could they say no Hindus, no Baha'is? Will those be fair things? It depends on your view of what a legitimate state is, basically. So some people think that a legitimate state is there to serve a certain particular group of people. Say, for example, the Muslims in a particular region, right? Now, if that is the case, then that state can basically say no to Hindus in the country, right? No to Christians in the country, no to Jews in the country. Now, there are important distinctions here to be made. For example, does the state already have, so let's think of a Muslim state, right? And ask the following question. The Muslim state doesn't want to have any Hindus in it, right? The question is, does the state already have a sizable population of Hindus? Because it makes a difference. So for instance, there is a difference in the kind of moral fairness where you say to Hindus, you're not allowed to immigrate and get citizenship in this country versus having an already existing Hindu population and stripping them of their citizenship or treating them as second-class citizens or worse, even kicking them out of the country. So my point is that even if you think that states can be legitimate if they are just there to preserve a particular culture, a lot depends on how they treat the other minorities and, their, and that depends on their past historical relationship with the minority, right? I don't think it's legitimate at all for a state to basically say, I'm going to kick out a bunch of people from my country because I want now my country to, to basically have a certain kind of character, right? Even if this kicking out was done by sort, some sort of referendum. So even if, for example, 90% of the people have agreed that we don't want this group to be in our midst anymore, so we have to kick it out, um, this might not be fair at all. As a matter of fact, the reason why in the United States we have something as the Bill of Rights is because we recognize the tyranny of the majority and what it can do to individual rights. So it's this delicate balance between maintaining a democracy in which the will of the people is represented, but at the same time making sure that this doesn't ride roughshod over, you know, over minority rights or individual rights, for example. So we have to keep that in mind. Now, having said this, I think it just so happens as a matter of fact that most states in the world, I'm hard pressed to think of a single country or a state in the world that is not multicultural in some way or the other. As a matter of fact, the question that a lot of states in Europe right now have to grapple with is that is the following. For a long time, they were able to maintain more or less some sort of cohesive nationalism. So for a long time, the French didn't have to deal with Muslim immigration from North Africa. There was something that they clearly recognized as being French. But now, not now, but for the last few centuries, for the last dec few decades, they have had a large number of Muslim immigrants from North Africa and from other parts of the world. And they have had to deal with the question, what does it mean to be a French citizen when you are somebody who has come from Algeria or who has come from Morocco, basically? The United States, countries like the United States, Canada and Australia, I don't know about South Africa as much, they don't have to deal with this question because the identity of being a Canadian or an American doesn't revolve around the nationality. It revolves around a certain set of ideals. Now, when you have Israel, you have the question with Israel, okay, Israel is the Jewish state, so it is not like the United States in this respect. There is definitely a certain kind of national sense, whether you think of Judaism as, a, as an ethnicity or as a religion or as a combination of two or three more things like that. You can still maintain that Israel is a Jewish state, right? And so Israel is going to have to face the question, and it has been facing it for a long time, what it means for itself, for it to maintain its Jewish character. And the main answer that, Israel, that the Israeli governments at least have been obsessed with is demographics. So one of the main things that they have been very much worried about is making sure that the Jews remain a majority in Israel. As a matter of fact, a lot of Israeli activists who are not sympathetic to the Palestinians, so it's not out of love for the Palestinians, have been advocating for a two-state solution precisely because they're worried that maintaining the West Bank and the Gaza Strip is basically in effect after a certain period of time is going to have to basically resort to a de facto one state in which the Jews become a minority in their own country, right? So this is the kind of, this is what has come to be called the demographic fear among Israeli Jews, basically, about it. Now, so that's a descriptive, that's a descriptive claim. Now, as a normative claim, however, I don't think it stands 
it's not very convincing for a couple of reasons. The first reason is, as you said yourself, Mark, Israel itself is a very diverse country. And I think you can look at Israel as some sort of a, as a series of spectra, right? So if you look at one spectrum, which has to do, which is the spectrum of ethnic identity, right? You can go from very Western Israeli Jew, right? To that towards the middle, which is being an Arab Jew or a Sephardic Jew, basically. So somebody whose parents came from Iraq or from Morocco or from Yemen, and then all the way to being a Palestinian Israeli. And I think there are a lot more cultural commonalities, for instance, between certain Jews who came from the Arab world with their fellow Palestinians, as there are between some Sephardic Jews and Ashkenazi Jews. As a matter of fact, another interesting side to Israel is not just the ultra-Orthodox versus the secular. You also have the Sephardic versus the Ashkenazi divide. And there have been a lot of interesting books written by Sephardic Jews about how their language has been treated, obliteration of certain letters, you know, what, and so on. So you have that. So on the one hand, you do have some sort of a cultural spectrum in Israel itself, so that and, and really the part of the cultural spectrum that I'm interested in isn't so much among the Jews, but it is the kind of spectrum that links them to the fellow Arabs. Because if a single state happens, that somewhat undercuts the idea that we are talking about two very different cultures from each other, so the twain shall never meet, basically. The other reason why I think we have to be wary of this, the Jewish character of Israel is because the fact of the matter is Israel's existence came at a moral price. It came at the price of basically dislodging a whole group of people who were living in the land, right? And so Israel has to come to grips with that fact. The fact that you have Palestinians who have claims to the territory, right, basically means that there are certain moral limits as to what Israel can do to maintain its Jewish character. And so it has to basically seed something on that ground. And then one third thing, which I would mention, is that there are a lot of ways for Israel to maintain its Jewish character that don't have to do with demographics, basically. So making Hebrew an official language, having certain state symbols. So you would add to those things by having a single state, for example, but you wouldn't do away with them, right? So even though we might reach a point where, say, Palestinians become a numerical majority in the country, this does not necessarily mean that the Jewish character of the state is completely drowned. There are ways to basically preserve it. And one, sorry, I'm droning about one way to preserve it is through the current law of return of Israel, which basically allows any Jew around the world to go to immigrate to Israel and become an Israeli citizen, right? Because Israel considers itself to be the state of the Jews, not just of the Israeli Jews, right? Which is a very paradoxical thing if you think about it. It's the only state in the world that claims that it, it is the state of people who actually reside outside its borders and have a completely different kind of citizenship. But be that as it may, right? One way to preserve the Jewish character of Israel is to basically say, look, no matter what happens, we're going to uphold the law of return so that any Jew around the world can come to Israel and become a citizen. So that could be another way to maintain it. So you've been arguing for this one state solution, yes, but sir. at the moment we don't have it, right? So at the moment we have a two state solution, or as Mark says, a three state solution, and there's conflict between those states. So there's conflict, it erupts and then it dies down and erupts between Palestine and Israel. And the question is, once that, that conflict erupts, what are the obligations involved on either side? Specifically, let's just start with Israel's obligations. So one of the things that Israel has been criticized for is disproportionality. Palestinian, Palestinians attack Israel in some way. That I'm not saying necessarily that is the start of the conflict, but at some point, Palestinians attack Israel, and Israel responds, some would say, with a disproportionate response. It's a much larger response than the initial attack. Is that legitimate? Is there a responsibility for proportionality in conflict between states? Uh, yes, if you look at traditional just war theory, for example, and especially with the conditions for the justice in war, as opposed to the justice of the war itself, we do have a main condition, which is the condition of proportionality, right? So the idea is that when you are doing battle with the enemy, you have to basically, you have to basically take those measures that are necessary to basically to stop the enemy from happening and no more. If you violate that condition, you would be violating the condition of proportionality. Now, what has happened in the conflict is that Israel has basically claimed the Palestinians to be anti-Israel because they're somehow anti-Semitic, right? So to, to a lot, to the way that Israel has wanted to look at this is to basically paint the Palestinians as being anti-Semitic terrorists. And so their very presence and their very actions against Israel are a threat to Israel's existence, so to speak. So Israel doesn't shy away from admitting that it, it has had recourse to a disproportionate amount of force, but 
in a way, Israel has tried to justify this by saying that due to the nature of the conflict and due to the nature of the Palestinian attacks, even if they are not as destructive as Israeli countermeasures, right? Israelis, Israel's countermeasures are justified because its very existence is in question. So yes, I don't know this whether this answers the question or not, Jason, but yes. Yeah, I, I just think there's some interesting historical cases. So for example, dropping bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which seem to be highly disproportionate to what happened before, but with the with the argument that it has prevented far more deaths from occurring afterwards. And there are people who defend those dropping of bombs and people who criticize them. Given that, I wonder whether proportionality holds. You you discuss pro- proportionality in terms of preventing future conflict. Of course, you can go all the way on that, right? So you can go as hard as you like in response that if you go hard enough, that will always prevent future conflict. Sure, of course. Yeah. So it's hard to cash out that principle of proportionality. Right, it is hard. And I do want to emphasize something, which is that, yes, the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki was justified by preventing further 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 deaths. I don't know whether this claim empirically holds true or not. We don't know. We also have to remember that before the atomic bombs, there were the Americans firebombed a lot of Japanese cities, including Tokyo, and with horrific death results, right? And so when the atomic bombs were dropped, they were the result of those atomic bombs came at the heels of having killed a lot of thousands of Japanese citizens also before that. So there are two questions here. The empirical question, whether that actually did shorten the war. I'm sure it shortened the war. I have no doubt in my mind that it shortened the war. The question is, how many deaths did it prevent? That's a very much different. If the American army, for example, had invaded the island of Japan, right, instead of dropping the atomic bombs, they would eventually conquer the island. They would have taken Japan down. I have no doubt in my mind, right? Up to that point, all the evidence points to the fact that the U.S. was winning the war. So the question is, how many casualties would the American army have had to deal with as opposed to the actual number of kibbutz? people killed by the atomic bombs. Now, if you go back to the Israeli-Palestinian situation, right, it doesn't seem that Israel's forceful measures have done anything at this point to prevent future, future. (laughs) As a matter of fact, it seems to be making it worse because short of basically finishing the job of 1947, which is just basically getting rid of the rest of the Palestinians that are in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, basically. Nothing nothing is going to remedy this conflict because what is happening is that you have attacks by Palestinians, counterattacks by Israelis, and we don't have to go into who starts all this. This can take us into a rabbit hole, right? But the counterattacks by Israel, as brutal as they have been, have not been brutal to the point where they actually decimated the Palestinian population. And that's what you need in order to prevent the conflict. Now, I'm not justifying the decimation of the Palestinian conflict. I hope nobody gets that impression. But that's the way to do it. As a matter of fact, there are maximalists in Israel. And some of them are current members of the government, right, the current government, who basically call for the transfer of the Arabs. They are not shy about it. They, At certain rallies, they chant death to the Arabs, death to the Arabs, right? And so they do think, and from a realistic from a realistic point of view, it makes sense, or it's twisted, but it makes sense, which is that one way to resolve the conflict is to basically get rid of the Arabs. But to me, that is on a moral par with those members of the Arab community who basically say the only way to resolve the conflict is to kick the Jews back to Europe, right, and make it a Palestinian land. So yes, as you said, you can go so disproportionately strong that you actually end up doing something about it. But of course, the price that you pay is so morally high that no one would want to accept it. Now, no peace is probably worth the effort. And then you have to also think about the consequences of the in the wider Arab world. So you get rid of the Palestinians, but then the Arab, the Arab street is, not, is probably not going to stand for it, basically. So you create even a, a different bundle of problems for yourself, for Israel. Right? So one very recent development that's happened is that there have been a number of peace treaties that have been struck with Israel. And during the sort of last days of Trump's regime, you had the Abraham Accords. And it seems like there's some mutual interest for those states to engage in commerce with each other, that Israel's a pioneer when it comes to tech and uh, water development, and that it's useful for everybody to be in a situation of peace, that trade's a good way to get there. It seems that has been paused at the moment that's i think there was an expectation that more and more states would sign up to those accords and that hasn't happened but i wonder would you have a view on other states let's say changing their policy to the palestinians at the moment egypt has a blockade up in gaza jordan doesn't welcome in palestinians in the west bank jordan from what i understand is 
a Palestinian majority state that is ruled by Hashemites. And there's a sense that Palestinians are not treated very well. There. But let's say that were to change. Would one viable solution be through, let's say, a combination of efforts for Palestinians to be accommodated in Egypt and in Jordan or other neighboring states with some kind of compensation? So, look, you've lived in Israel for a large period of time, but everybody's going to come to the party, provide you with access to resources, land, a new place. That's the sort of thing that Israel did for, for Jews that are expelled from other countries. Is there some kind of obligation on neighboring Arab states to do that? It would end the conflict. It might be better for those people. Not everyone would want to leave. Some people would say, look, I don't care how much you pay me. This land is much more important to me than that. Others might say, look, I've been stuck here because of all the blockades and I'd love to live a free life in some other country. I'd love to go. Yeah, this is nice. So let me just say something. I'm just going to plug in one quick historical fact, which is that the Arab states have always been very political about the Palestinian issue. In other words, people have the impression that the Arabs were hostile to the Jewish state from the get-go. This is a false historical record. As a matter of fact, we know that King Abdullah of Jordan, who is the great-grandfather of the current King of Jordan, has had multiple meetings with Ben-Gurion, with Golda Meir, when she was still young at the time, and all this. Egypt's Jamal Abdel Nasser, who is usually considered to be the scion of Arab nationalism and all this, have also hated having to go to war to Israel. There's the historical... So the fact that Arab states, the fact that Egypt has now been blocking Gaza for a while, the fact that the United Arab Emirates is willing to have a peace accord with Israel and so is Bahrain, I don't think this is such a drastic change, of course, in history and in in Arab policy. Arab states, first and foremost, cared only about their political interests. They, they, as a matter of fact, many of them used the Palestinian cause as a pawn in there. Now, that, this is not to say that the historical record is not more complicated, but in general, it has been characterized that way. Now, would it be a viable solution for the Palestinians to, so to speak, be absorbed in other Arab countries, say Jordan or Egypt, as you mentioned, or Syria or Lebanon? It would be a viable solution in the sense that it would allow many Palestinian refugees to finally be settled, right? Yeah, to be able to have decent jobs for a change. I don't know whether you know this or not, but Lebanon, for instance, my own country, restricts uh, restricts the kind of jobs that Palestinians can work in. So they cannot work as engineers, they cannot work as doctors, unless they are working within the refugee camps, right? They have denied them citizenship. Jordan is the only Arab country that has given them citizenship. So it's a viable solution in the sense that it eases the suffering of the Palestinians. And we know that they have been going through a lot. Now, whether it's a viable solution in the sense that it is a fair solution, it's a just solution, is a different question. I don't think it's a just solution in the sense that it does deprive the Palestinians from their territorial rights to the region, to, the, to their country, to, the, to, to Palestine. And for really no good reason in my mind, other than to just basically allow other than basically to other than basically to allow Israel to maintain a Jewish majority in the state and maintain all that. Which is fine, except that, as I said before, I think it has it did come at the moral expense of an entire people. So, in that fair, it's in that sense, it's not a fair solution. However, I also want to say, and it saddens me to say this, which is that there is something called supersession in political philosophy, which is that if you give enough time to something, at some point, so at some point, the moral issue becomes moot. So, for instance, Arabs right now cannot go to Spain and say, "Hey, we want citizenship rights in, St in Spain because we conquered your asses." 500 years ago, right? Although interestingly, I think in 2002, there was a number of Sephardic Jews went to Barcelona and had a conference and demanded the right of return to Spain. So at least as far as those Jews were concerned, their rights to Spain didn't go away after centuries. But we do think that supersession, we do think that supersession is a fact, right? And that after a certain passage of time, certain moral claims become moot. However, I also think, so, so what I'm trying to say is that if you give the conflict enough time, and I think this is what Israel is banking on from a real political, from, if you look at it from a realistic, real politic kind of view, I think part of what's being banked on is that if we just uh, stay put, basically, long enough, this question is going to become irrelevant. And the more factors change with the passage of time, the more and more irrelevant it's going to be. So if you ask the question maybe 200 years from now, 300 years from now, is the Palestinian absorption into Syria and Jordan and Lebanon, is, was that a fair thing to happen? Probably from that vantage point in time, you would say it is fair. But you can also say from the point of view of 2023 or 2020 or 1950 or 1960, no, it wasn't a fair solution, although it was a viable solution. 
So I think that's more, it's a complicated answer to your question, Mark, but I think it does it justice. And it's not just the passage of time. There have to be changing circumstances. It has to be a fact that Palestinians were actually absorbed into the Arab lands. Because if Palestinians continue to insist on their identity, right, and to maintain their cohesion and to refuse, which they have been doing so far in the majority, they have been refusing to actually be absorbed into Arab lands because they have been insisted on the fact that they are people of their own and that they need to retain their homes and their rights and so on and so forth. So for the absorption to happen, they have to give up those claims. So those facts have to happen also. It's not just the passage of time itself, but the facts themselves have to happen. Yeah. So I hope that made sense. Yeah. Well, Roger, this has been an absolutely delightful conversation. I think these kinds of discussions are often so heated and emotional and, uh, and rooted in a kind of you did this and we did that kind of uh, dynamic. And it's been uh, really great to be able to talk about it in a civil way and have some abstract principles that we can apply to a live situation. Yeah, absolutely. I've been thinking about this issue for a long, long time. I grew up with it when I was a child. So when moving to the United States gave me a chance to have Jewish friends. I met a lot of Israelis here. I've never been to Israel myself, and it's a question for me whether I want to go or not. It not only made me more sympathetic to the other side, so to speak, but it also made me know how to talk to people about it. So I don't get puffy and puffy when I talk about it. I understand where a lot of people are coming from. I understand where my fellow Palestinians and Lebanese are coming from, but I also understand where my where my fellow Jews are coming from about this, even hot-headed Jews, like even those maximalists who are like right-wing, death to the Arab kind of thing. I'm able to talk to them. I've like known enough about this conflict to know how to talk to them. You know, sometimes there are outbursts, but you know, in, in general, I tend to be very level-headed about this. And I, I'm kind of glad about that.